Good afternoon. I'll call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Community Development Committee of the Metropolitan Council, the Met Council's first meeting of 2020. Congratulations. Mm. All welcome back and Happy New Year. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed their holidays. Uh, committee members, uh, we have an agenda before us. Are there any changes, amendments? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval, please. So moved. Second. Second. Great discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. And next is approval of the minutes of December 16th, 2019 of the CDC. Is there a motion? Move approval. Uh, second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 And we move on to our business items. Uh, first business item is the City of Oak Grove 2040 Comprehensive Plan. It's 2020 1. Uh, and that will be presented by Eric Wycheck. Mr. Wycheck, welcome. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lily Bren. Um, Happy New Year to you. And um, Thank you. the city of Oak Grove is here today, and uh, they seem to think that I was generous in putting this first in the agenda, and I said it was all because of me. It was actually completely accidental. Um, my name is Eric Wycheck. I'm a sector representative for districts 2, 9, and 10. Uh, Oak Grove is within District 9. And I'd like to let the committee know that uh, Chuck Schwartz, uh, the team leader over at MSA Consulting is in the audience. Uh, he worked on this plan and the city of Oak Grove's city administrator, Lauren, Lauren Wickham is also in the audience. I think they're kind of in the middle there. Uh, thank you for being um, here. I wanted to thank them both for all the hard work on this plan. Uh, Oak Grove was one of the first cities out of the gate in terms of you know, getting us up there to work with them on their checklist and work with them on the plan. So that was, you know, we've been had have a we've had a really good working relationship with them through the process. Great. So do I have a? Oh, here we go. The this map shows the location of the regional system components within the city of Oak, Oak Grove. Anoka County is the park implementing agency for this area. And the regional park system components consist of uh, the Lake George and Rum River Central Regional Parks. There's also the North Anoka County Regional Trail Search Corridor. And there's also some state recreational land in the city, uh, the Robert and Marilyn Berman Wildlife Management Area. And that's, within, that's in figure one of the report. In terms of wastewater, the plan does not propose any or nor anticipates uh, requesting connection to the regional wastewater disposal system in the future and will continue to rely on um, uh, SSTSs for new development. Uh, for transportation, there are no principal arterials located within the city of Oak Grove. The community designation for the city of Oak Grove as of the 2015 system statement was uh, rural residential and diversified rural, as you can see from this slide. There is a revised community designation uh, within the 2040 plan um, and the designation for rural residential still is the same, but within the southeast portion of the city, the staff report in the background section highlights that that southeast portion has been changed from diversified rural to rural residential. And that was changed uh, through the state legislature in 2017. And with the removal of that diversified rural community designation, about a thousand acres in that southeast portion of the city, the council will also revise its water resources policy plan to show that that southeast portion of the city is no longer planned for any post 2040 urban services. And that urban service would have come from that East Bethel plant uh, just to the east of that location. Oak Grove is located in the northern, northern portion of Anoka County. It is surrounded by the communities of St. Francis to the north, East Bethel, Ham Lake, Andover, Ramsey, and now then. Table one within the staff report shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts the city will grow by 1,800 people representing about 1,000 households. There will be an increase at that same time of around 80 jobs within the same, within the city. The city's existing land use map refers to figure three in the staff report. 
Existing land uses in Oak Grove are pr predominantly agricultural and undeveloped land at about 66%. Second largest use being residential at 22%. And most of the existing commercial and industrial are located along the transportation corridors in the community. Around 11% of the city is parks and open space. The plan is consistent with Thrive for land use and residential density policies for a rural residential community designation. Within the plan, the city guides rural residential land at a development density of one unit per 2.5 acres. Future land use, uh, the 2040 future land use doesn't differ too much from what we saw in the 2030 plan. Um, the city's historic development pattern and previous comprehensive plan approvals um, and the special law that came into effect um, really dictate how, how the city has developed uh, with this rural residential development pattern of two and a half acre lots. Um, due to the rural residential designation, regional wastewater, as I mentioned earlier, regional wastewater service is not contemplated for the city of Oak Grove in this planning period. The city indicates that the rural residential land use category is intended to maintain the existing rural development pattern established, established through previous planning efforts. Uh, properties are required to maintain enough buildable land to accommodate the construction of permitted structures, including primary and secondary septic systems or community systems in the case of cluster housing. So the city of Oak Grove does uh, take into account the Metropolitan Council's flexible development guidelines. So in some cases they will allow for cluster development. The proposed findings within the report state that the plan conforms to metropolitan system plans, is consistent with council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. This plan will be on the metropolitan council agenda at the January 22nd meeting. And again, I just want to point out that um, Chuck Schwartz from MSA is in the audience and Lauren Wickham from the city of Oak Grove are in the audience and I'd like to thank them for all their hard work on this plan. Proposed action here, the council staff proposed the following actions. Authorize the city of Oak Grove to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect. Revise the community designation for that southeastern portion of the city to rural residential in accordance with a special law from the first special session in uh, 2017 and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for wastewater, surface water management, land use, and water supply. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wycheck. Questions on that report? Any questions? Seeing none, I'd like to thank Mr. Schwartz, is it? Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Wickham for being here today. Thanks for your work. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the City of Oak Grove 2040 Comprehensive Plan. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you. We'll move on to our second business item. It's 2020-3. It'll be heard in the Environment Committee as well. It's the City of Brooklyn Park 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. And again, this is yours, Mr. Wycheck. Please. Thank you, Chair Lilligren. I wanted to see if um, City of Brooklyn Park representatives are in the audience, or did they not? We might be moving too fast for them. Uh, I'm um, sure they're here in spirit. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out if people uh, come in the room. Um, I know that the community, sorry, the um, City of Brooklyn Parks Planning Director, Cindy Sherman, plans to be in attendance today, along with Aaron Perdue, the Director of Community Planning and Economic Development for WSB Consulting. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for them so we can thank them later on. Before you is the City of Brooklyn Parks 2040 Comprehensive Plan. This map here shows the regional system components within the City of Brooklyn Park. Three Rivers Park District is the park implementing agency for the City of Brooklyn Park. And uh, in terms of regional park system components, we have the Mississippi Gateway Regional Park, formerly known as the Coon Rapids Dam Regional Park. That, that name has changed. Shingle Creek, Rush Lake, and Crystal Lake Regional Trails. And the West Mississippi River, River Regional Trail Search Corridor. These are all located within figure one in your report. There are no state or federal recreation lands within the city. The city's plan accurately accounts for the metropolitan highway system of principal arterials, of which there are four. 
Um, the most the most important one maybe to mention would be that the the plan has um, identified planned additions and improvements that are within the current revenue scenario of the TPP, including um, Trunk Highway 169 or 101st Avenue uh, interchange. The plan also incorporates existing and future transit ways, um, including five LRT stations along the Blue Line extension, uh, also within the current revenue scenario within the TPP. For transit ways that are in service or in advanced states of planning, the plan incorporates guiding land use for station areas that meet the minimum density targets of the TPP. In terms of wastewater, all wastewater generated within the city is conveyed through seven council interceptors, and all that flow is treated at the council's Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant in St. Paul. MSP 2040 um, has this area designated, has the city designated as suburban. Brooklyn Park is located along the northeastern border of Hennepin County. It is surrounded by the communities of Champlin, Coon Rapids, Fridley, Brooklyn Center, Crystal, New Hope, Plymouth, Maple Grove, and Osseo. Table 1, also in your staff report, shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow by 14,900 people, representing 5,580 households. Uh, there will be an increase of 8,100 jobs in the city in the same time frame. The plan does request for a forecast revision, but not to the 2040 totals. Um, the forecast revision really applies to the 2020 and 2030 uh, totals, and council staff have agreed to that change. Table two from the staff report shown here illustrates the planned residential density in the suburban area of the city the suburban community designation. Uh, the overall density for guided residential land is expected to be between 11.04 and 42.32 units per acre. Uh, communities with that suburban designation are expected to uh, grow at overall average densities of at least five units per acre and target opportunities for more intensive development near regional transit investments. Brooklyn Park's plan is consistent with this policy. Existing land uses within the city are predominantly residential at just below 50%, uh, with most of the existing commercial and office about 5%, and industrial areas just over 6% near the transportation corridors. Approximately 12% of the city is parks and open space. Future, the city's future land use map refers to figure four in your staff report. Um, the most interesting thing about about uh, the future land use really is the incorporation of the five station areas and planning for appropriate density and intensity of use around those station areas. The plan recognizes those five Metro Blue, Metro Blue Line LRT station areas, uh, which are part of that current revenue scenario in the TPP. TPP directs suburban communities with planning LRT to guide at average minimum densities of 20 residential units per acre and target 40 to 75 plus units per acre within the station area or within a 10 minute walk or half mile. Um, the plan densities, plan densities for areas identified for redevelopment in station areas within the city are consistent with the minimum density required in the TPP. Uh, the city of Brooklyn Park has been planning for uh, this LRT extension. They've done a lot of work in this area since 2016. Uh, they've also incorporated uh, transit-oriented development zoning in 2018. Uh, so they've been pretty hard at work in planning for this major regional transit investment. Council staff finds that the plan conforms to regional system plans, is consistent with council policies with proposed forecast, with the proposed forecast changes. It's compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. This plan will be before the Environment Committee on Tuesday, January 14th, and then it will go to the Council for Authorization on Wednesday, January 22nd. And I just want to see if any Brooklyn Park representatives are here. No, not yet. Okay, maybe they didn't make it. Um, in any case, uh, we worked really hard with the city on this plan. Um, 
I believe, well, there was a bit of toing and froing in terms of um, letters back and forth and working with them on this. So I'm happy to have the plan at this stage ready for authorization. Uh, the city has been great to work with throughout this whole process. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to personally thank Cindy Sherman. She's been uh, very professional and, and wonderful to work with. The proposed actions with, within the staff report are the following, to authorize the City of Brooklyn Park to place its 2040 conference and plan into effect, to revise the city's forecast for the 2030 and 20, uh, 2020 and 2030 uh, decades downward, as shown in Table 1 of the review record, to revise the city's affordable housing need allocation in line with that forecast revision to 795 units, and advise the city to um, adopt the Mississippi River Critical Corridor Area Plan within 60 days of receiving final DNR approval, and submit a copy of the final adopted plan and evidence of adoption to the DNR, Metropolitan Council, and the National Park Service within 10 days after the adoption. Finally, to implement the advisory comments in the review record for forecast, housing, and water supply. Happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Whitecheck. Questions on that report? Any questions? If not, Councilmember Chambliss, would you like to move approval of the City of Brooklyn Parks 2040 Comprehensive? I'd be glad to move approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Please pass our thanks on to Ms. Sherman and the City of Brooklyn Park staff. Item three is 2020 2. Also will be seen in Environment Committee. It's the City of Waconia 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. And it'll be uh, Ms. Raya Smiley, Smiley that'll present. Mrs. Smiley, welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, I'm Raya Smiley. I'm the uh, Senior Planner in Local Planning Assistance, and I'm the Sector Representative for uh, Carver and Scott County. So that's District 4 and Chanhassen. That's District 3. Um, and fortunately, folks from the city could not be here today. I thought that they will be, so um, we will keep an eye out for them as well. Uh, so before you today is the city of Waconia's uh, 2040 comprehensive plan um, for your action. Uh, this map shows the um, regional system components within the city of Waconia. There are no uh, principal arterial within the city of Waconia and there's also uh, two um, MCES interceptors uh, within the city as well as Lake Waconia Carver Regional Trail Search Corridor and County Road 10 Regional Trail Search Corridor. Uh, so those are, and then there's the, sorry, Lake Waconia uh, Regional Park that is kind of in the upper corner that's technically partially within uh, the orderly annexation agreement boundary with the um, Waconia Town, not Waconia Town, sorry, Lake Town Township. Uh, so that's also in the ultimate boundary of the city of Waconia. Thrive MSB 2040 designated the city as emerging suburban edge. Uh, the city of Waconia is located within Carver County and it is surrounded by the two townships of Lake Town and Waconia. So Lake Town is uh, to the east and then Waconia Township is to the south and west. Uh, table one, also in your staff report, uh, shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow by 9,800 people, representing 4,100 households, and there will be an increase of 2,600 jobs in the city within the same time frame. Uh, this is the table two of the staff report. Uh, it illustrates the planned residential density uh, within the emerging suburban edge uh, designation of the city of Waconia. The overall density for guided uh, land is expected to be between 3.39 and 8.17 units per acre. The communities that are designated as emerging suburban edge by uh, Thrive are expected to plan for forecasted population and growth at density of uh, at least three units per acre, sorry, three to five units per acre um, for both development and redevelopment and Waconia is consistent with our policy for that. 
this is the uh, city's existing land use map. So you can see the um, boundary of the city uh, with that uh, very thick dashed line. Um, so in the city um, of Waconia with their existing land use, uh, the majority uh, of the existing land use is residential and that's about 45%. Um, and otherwise, uh, after that, is they have some office, commercial, and industrial uses. Uh, there are most of the areas within on the edge of the city are agricultural, and we'll talk a little more about the land use in this map. Uh, so this is the future land use uh, map that is the figure four of your staff report. Um, the plan includes. Um, the areas that are identified and with a boundary of like a red boundary, you can see there are a few points. Uh, those are uh, areas within uh, Waconia Township that the city does not have an orderly annexation agreement with the township. So um, those areas um, that they have planned for, <clears throat> that is basically the uh, ultimate vision for that area as they are annexed into the community when uh, an annexation request is on the table. The areas um, that are to the right um, of this, the majority um, of the boundary of, of the, sorry, can I point? I cannot point. Uh, so the, basically the entire eastern side of the city, that's an area that the city has an orderly annexation agreement with Lake Town Township. And uh, therefore, uh, the city has the authority to plan for any of those areas that are uh, within their orderly annexation um, boundary with Lake Town Township. And they also identify all the areas that are um, designated as agricultural preserves so, and, um, and plan for those accordingly with the uh, density of one un no more than one unit per 40 acre. Um, so the proposed uh, findings before you is that the plan conforms to the metropolitan system plans, is consistent with uh, council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. This uh, plan is scheduled to go to the Environment Committee next week on January 14th, and then uh, for the Metropolitan Council meeting on uh, January 22nd. So the proposed action for you, which is a bit of a lengthy one, um, is to authorize the city of Waconia to put into effect the portion of its 2040 comprehensive plan pertaining to the areas within the city's boundary as of November 19, 2019. That is the date that we deem the plan complete. Uh, and those portions of Lake Town Township for which, uh, for which the city has an ex existing orderly annexation agreement and advise the city that the council has reviewed the remainder of the plan and has found no regional system conformance or policy consistency issues at this time because the city does not have the legal authority to plan and zone for areas within Waconia Township in the absence of an OAA. The city may not put those portions of the plan into effect at this time, at such time as the city of Waconia uh, acquires jurisdiction of the lands plan for future urbanization in Waconia Township either through an uh, orderly annexation agreement or annexation by ordinance, the city will need to submit appropriate plan amendments to the council for further review and action. And also advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for surface water management, land use, and water supply. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Questions on that report? Any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Smiley has proposed a series of actions relative to the 2020 City of Waconia 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Is there a motion for approval? Move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you. We'll move on to item business item number four, 2020-10. Uh, also, will be an environment committee. It's the Cindy of Chanhassen, 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. And uh, this is yours again, Mrs. Smiley. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Um, I would like to let the committee know uh, that uh, staff from the City of Chanhassen are here in the audience. Kate Jensen, the Community Development Director. Uh, Bob Generous, Senior Planner, and Mackenzie Young-Walters, Associate Planner, are all 
all in the audience, and I want to thank them for the process of going through this plan and working with us so closely. Um, it was a delight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so before you today is the City of Chanhassen's 2040 Comprehensive Plan. This map shows the location of the regional system components within the City of Chanhassen. Um, from the transportation uh, policy plan components, uh, the highway, uh, Trunk Highway 7 and Trunk Highway 212 are both going through the city of Chanhassen. There are several uh, regional parks policy plan, regional parks, sorry, components uh, within the city. That's Lake Minnewashita Regional Park, Minnesota River Bluffs LRT Regional Trail, Highway 101 Regional Trail Search Corridor, Highway 5 Regional Trail Search Corridor, Twin Cities and Western Regional Trail Search Corridor, County Road 61 Regional Trail Search Corridor and <laughs> Highway 4 Regional Trail Search Corridor. <laughs> there are also six interceptors, uh, MCS uh, interceptors within the boundary of the city of Chanhassen. Uh, Thrive has designated the city as emerging suburban edge. Chanhassen is located along the eastern border of Carver County. Uh, so it is surrounded by the communities of uh, Shorewood, Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, Shakopee, Jackson Township, Chaska, and Victoria. Table one, which is also in your staff report, shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow by 10,400 people, representing 4,000 households. There will be an increase of 2,800 jobs in the city in the same time frame. And as you can see, this includes the uh, proposed changes to the forecast that is also part of the action uh, for this item. Table two of the staff report uh, shows similar information, uh, but this is uh, the sewer service forecasts, which are also uh, being revised for uh, the population and for all 2020, 2030, 2040 uh, households and employment. So all the sewer service forecasts are being uh, revised uh, and that's also part of the action. Table three from the staff report is um, the planned residential density uh, in the city of Chanhassen. The overall density for guided residential land use is between 3.05 and 7.04 units per acre. Um, Thrive directs uh, emerging suburban edge communities to plan for residential growth in development and redevelopment areas between three and five, at a minimum of three to five units per acre. And the city of Chanhassen's plan is consistent with our policies. Um, figure one of this, sorry, figure three of the staff report is the existing land use plan for the city of Chanhassen. Um, and um, as you can see, the, well, the majority of the uh, land uses within the city are um, low density residential. That's about a third of the city. And after that, followed by um, office, industrial and commercial. And also about 9% of the city is um, well, parks and open space. Uh, the cities, this is the figure four of the staff report, uh, which is the um, future land use. Um, in the future, this is the, um, it shows that the city has planned for uh, the majority of the industrial and uh, activity based uh, land uses along the transportation corridors. And uh, that's basically um, immediately west of and some areas immediately west of lakes lucy and Anne, and some areas in the central chanhassen so the proposed findings before you today is that the city the city's plan conforms to the metropolitan system plans is consistent with council policies with the proposed forecast changes and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions the meeting schedule is similar to the city of Waconia. The plan is scheduled to go before the Environment Committee on January 14th and before the uh, whole Metropolitan Council uh, on January 22nd. The proposed action before you is to authorize the city of Chanhassen to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, revise the city's forecast upward as shown in table one of the review record, Revise the city's sewer service forecast upward as shown in table two of the review record and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for surface water management.
With that, um, I want to remind the community that staff from the City of Chan Hessen in the audience, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Smiley, and thanks to our visitors from Chan Hessen for your collaboration and your work on this. Uh, any questions on that report? Any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Smiley has proposed action on the City of Chan Hassan 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thanks again, Mrs. Smiley. Uh, business item number five is 2020 4, also will be in Environment Committee. It's the City of Golden Valley 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Uh, presented by Michael Larson. Mr. Larson, welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and Happy New, New Year to you as Thank well. You. Uh, I'm Mike Larson. I'm Senior Planner uh, in Local Planning Assistance in the Community Development Division. I'm also the Sector Rep for Golden Valley. Uh, I do want to let the committee know that um, Jason Zimmerman, the City of Golden Valley's Planning Manager, uh, was not able to join us this afternoon, but I did get a few comments from, from him that I'd like to share with you about, about their comprehensive plan and the adoption of it. So before you today is the review of the City of Golden Valley's 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Uh, this map shows the location of regional system components within the city. Regional park system elements include uh, the Theater Worth Regional Park uh, and the Loose Line, Victory Memorial, and Bassett Creek Regional Trails. Regional trail search corridors include the South Hennepin West or CP Rail and CP Rail Extension uh, Regional Trail Search Corridors. Uh, future uh, transit ways include the Metro Blue Line Extension, uh, including its, uh, including the single station that will serve uh, Golden Valley at Golden Valley Road. And regional highway system elements include Interstate 394, Olson, Olson Memorial Highway, and uh, Highway 100. All wastewater generated within the city is conveyed through three council interceptors and is treated at the council's Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plan in St. Paul. Thrive MSP designates the city as urban. Uh, Golden Valley is located in east central Hennepin County uh, and is surrounded by the communities of New Hope, Crystal, Robbinsdale, Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, and Plymouth. So as shown in uh, Table 1, the city has uh, proposed the future households and population that are, that are uh, revised higher, uh, a recent boom in multifamily development, um, not an unusual story, uh, has pushed up both near-term and long-term growth. Uh, the city also proposes uh, a lower employment forecast, and city and council staff have discussed this and agreed upon uh, this provision. Table two from the staff report, also shown here, illustrates the plan residential uh, density in the urban areas, urbanized areas of the city. The overall density for guided residential land is expected to be uh, between 15.2 and 60.4 units per acre. Uh, communities with an urban designation under Thrive are expected to plan for forecasted population household growth at average densities of 10 units per acre for new development and redevelopment. Urban communities are expected to target opportunities for more intensive development near transit investments at densities in a manner <coughs> articulated in the transportation policy plan. Uh, and Golden Valley's plan is consistent uh, with this policy. Although I will note that they're fairly limited, given the proximity of the Golden Valley Station uh, near Theater Worth Park, there are somewhat limited uh, redevelopment opportunities at that station. The city uh, of Golden Valley uh, includes the world headquarters for General Mills and the Tenant Company, as well as major presence by Honeywell. Uh, the city includes uh, the, uh, the city includes Theater Worth uh, Regional Park, although this is a uh, unit of the Minneapolis uh, Park Recreation Board, uh, and it will be served by, as I mentioned before, the planned extension of, of the Blue Line uh, at Golden Valley Road. The plan, uh, Jen, in general, identifies six uh, redevelopment areas and more specific areas for potential redevelopment through 2040. Uh, uh, guiding for commercial and industrial land throughout the city uh, coincides with the major transportation corridors that serve the city, including uh, the Interstate 394, Olson Memorial Highway, Highway 100, and also the three uh, rail road corridors that uh, intersect the city, including the BNSF, uh, Canadian Pacific, and Union Pacific. The proposed findings uh, for you today is that the, the plan conforms to metropolitan system plans, is consistent with council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. 
uh, meeting scheduled for this is that on July, um, sorry, <laughs> not July, January 14th, Environmental Services staff will present to the Environmental Committee and will be seen by the full council at the January 22nd meeting. Uh, and um, uh, let's see here, proposed action for you is to authorize the City of Golden Valley to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, to revise the city's forecast upward as shown in table one on the attached review record, and revise uh, the city's allocation of affordable housing need accordingly to 222 units, and advise the city to implement uh, some advisory comments really into the uh, in the review record of <coughs> surface water management. Uh, and before I conclude, I would like to uh, read the email from um, that I received from the city. Uh, or from Jason uh, Zimmerman, the planning manager. He says that overall, our planning commission and city council are pleased with the, co the cohesiveness of the new plan and the lists of goals and action items at the end of each chapter, uh, organized by timing, uh, one, five, and 10-year targets and relative costs. And that was also something that we were impressed with as well as the ability to use uh, that material in the plan to present, to excerpt that material and to present on an annual basis for, for work planning and capital improvement planning. Uh, Jason goes on to say, as planning staff, we are excited about updating our update to mixed use zoning district, which will allow uh, up to, um, which will promote nodes of activities along major transportation corridors. He says, we've already had interest from developers in advance of the rezonings in our downtown and along Douglas Drive. Uh, and he finally concludes by saying, I think we will be focusing a lot on housing and sustainability in the next few years. Uh, so Mr. Chair, that, um, Concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Larson, and our thanks to Mr. Zimmerman for his comments and for the city's work on this. Are there any questions on that report? Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Larson. I was just curious, with the uptick in multifamily housing, do we track where these people are coming from? Are they coming from Minneapolis or other west, western suburbs? Mr. Larson. I might defer the, to the director to answer that question more globally. Um, <coughs> director Brajas. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Lee, um, not specifically for an individual development uh, growth in Golden Valley, for example, we don't track um, as it is occurring. Um, our staff do look at, if you recall, um, the presentation that Todd Graham um, from our research unit gave last fall around forecasting um, and census and how those two pieces work together is that we do look at in migration, out migration. Um, uh, changes from um, uh, international uh, immigration as well that influence our overall growth, but um, uh, movements within the, the metro area are much more difficult to, to track on a regular basis. Thank you. Further questions on the report? Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a, not a question, just a comment. I grew up in, in Golden Valley ah. and I lived there from like 1968 until 76 or so. And I was a geek way back then, so I still remember that the population was around 24,000 at the time. Still is. They have a lot more housing units now. It dropped for some time, and now they're just getting back to that sure. population level that they had back in the early 1970s, which shows you the power of household size, because they have a lot more households now than mm -hmm. they did then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Further comments or questions on Mr. Larson's report? Seeing none, Mr. Larson proposes four actions related to the City of Golden Valley 24 Comprehensive Plan. Is there a motion to approve? Please. Council, I'm just meant to call on you. I'm sorry, Councilmember Atlas okay. Singer Britson. Thank, Thank you. you for that motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion on the motion? Discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Business item number six, 20-11. 20, 20 it's the Ramsey County 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Patrick Mullen will present. Mr. Moylan, welcome. Happy Thank New Year. Thank you, Council members. Um, I'm Patrick Boylan. I'm the sector representative uh, in 13, 14, 15, and 16. Your staff report uh, makes mention of um, Council members Lindstrom, uh, Bento and Muse, but I just want to add that uh, Council Member Lee and Fredson are also part of mm -hmm. Ramsey County. Um, uh, Fredson exclusively in just a portion of St. Paul and uh, Council Member Lee in some suburban communities, but in also a significant portion of St. Paul as well. Thank you for pointing um, that out. I'd like the committee to know that Max uh, Holthusen of Ramsey County is in the audience today. And as a quick thank you to the collaborative effort he represented, 
Um, I was invited to, a, he and I met a couple of times uh, early on in their process, and then he also invited me to speak with other staff and uh, towns and county commissioners. Um, but then also uh, had a chance when they reached out to their suburban communities and had a, a larger meeting, and uh, I was invited to um, come to that as well. So I just wanted to um, uh, extend a personal and professional thank you for that. Um, there are many regional systems in Ramsey County. I'm not going to name them all. However, um, the map before you from the staff report shows um, that Ramsey County is the most urbanized county in the state and therefore the metro and includes segments of at least four interstate freeways and several minor arterials. And to summarize, um, there are many regional wastewater meters and lift stations, uh, bus rapid transit and the Metro Green Line uh, is a significant um, transit um, investment by the uh, council uh, in the county. And a regional airport is located outside of downtown St. Paul and the region's largest wastewater treatment plant is located in the county as well. Um, there are numerous regional trails and search corridors in uh, the county, including Long Lake, Bald Eagle, Otter Lake, Battle Creek, and my personal favorite is Hidden Falls uh, Crosby Farm, and Como's in there too. Um, the community designation um, for the county, um, it's Ramsey County is located in the central part of the seven county metropolitan area, um, and as stated earlier, it's the most urbanized county in the state. And except for North Oaks and a very small portion of Blaine, it's hard to see. Um, the county is um, uh, um, the county. The community designations are suburban, urban, and urban center. Um, it's bordered by Anoka, Washington, Dakota, and um, uh, Hennepin counties. So Ramsey County, unlike a city, Ramsey County does not have land use authority. So the majority of their focus um, is on human services, um, parks, and transportation. And so I just want to take a quick second and talk about um, what I think is the most beautiful urban, um, sorry, the most beautiful uh, county um, building in the metropolitan area. If you have a chance, if you haven't, um, you have a, you go up there for a meeting in St. Paul over the Ramsey County, um, take a minute to look at the outside of the building and the inside of the building. Um, this bass relief on the outside um, embedded into the um, uh, facade is um, rather stunning. Um, it has a very kind of dated look to it. Um, this looks like, you know, the mid to late 1920s, maybe 1930s. Um, and the statue um, on the inside um, is uh, first commissioned or unveiled in 1936, and war names were added to commemorate the war dead from World War I. Um, 1988, the VFW added uh, names of soldiers who died in combat from World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, and now there's 1,578 uh, names engaged, engraved um, on the walls that are surrounding um, uh, lost to war. Um, the statute was later renamed Vision of Peace in 1984 in a special ceremony involving three major Native American Indian tribes. Um, the statue weighs approximately 60 tons and is 38 feet high and was carved from onyx um, stone. And the elevators, of course, are rather stunning too. Back to regional policy. <laughs> Table one in your staff report um, shows that between 2020 and 2040, um, the council forecasts the county to grow by 45,100 um, people, and that represents 20,590 households. Um, there will be an increase of 36,940 jobs in the county in the same time frame. In your staff report, the proposed findings is the plan conforms to metropolitan system plans. It's consistent with council policies. And it's combated with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. Later this month, uh, the full council will see this. This will not go to the Environment Committee because there is no regional sanitary sewer that's under the jurisdiction of the county. Proposed action as part of my staff report uh, states to authorize Ramsey County to place its 2040 conference plan into effect and to advise uh, the county um, to adopt the Mississippi River Critical Cr Corridor, sorry, Mississippi River Critical Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area Plan within 60 days of receiving the DNR final approval and to submit a copy of the final adopted plan and evidence of adoption to the DNR, the Metropolitan Council, and National Park Service within 10 days after the adoption. The proposed action also continues to say that the authorization of the county's plan does not commit the council to funding expansion or improvements to Trunk Highway 36 the interchange at Interstate 35E and County Road J, the Anoka County's interchange at County Road J and Interstate 35W right on the border of the county, and as these projects are not in the current revenue service of the Transportation Policy Plan. Um, also further, to implement the advisory committee advisory comments in the review record for forecasts and transportation. 
just as a reminder, uh, Max Holthusen, Holthusen is in the audience today, and I'm available for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Mould. Uh, boy, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Boylan, thank you. I also had a little brain moment. And I was trying to remember the name of the Ramsey County staffer that you said, and that was a doozy, so if you could remind me. Max Holthusen. Yeah. Holthusen? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Holdusen, for being here and for your work on, on this. Any questions on Mr. Boylan's report? Mr. Any, Chair? Yeah, Councilman I just Johnson. want to do a shout out. You know, I've been watching uh, Ramsey County Means Business showing up in the media lately. And while it's not directly related to this comp plan, um, it's really a culmination of a lot of work uh, over recent years to really um, target additional business growth. Um, and site selectors are kind of the primary target of that, but I do appreciate, um, you know, in our metropolitan region, uh, the efforts to, again, grow our, our business community, um, you know, economic engine in the state, and um, certainly it's showing up, I would believe, in some of these employment numbers, too. So um, just kudos to them. Great. Thank you for that comment, Council Member. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to Mr. Boylan for pointing out the public art. I worked for six years in uh, the mayor's office, and so the city hall is in the same building as Ramsey County, and and the third floor, the county, and the third floor is the um, city council chambers, and the county has a task force that is looking to replace the murals in there. So in the, I don't know what the timeline is, but that'd be a really interesting um, thing to see when when that's also done, and also in the basement of, of this building. Um, there's a staff cafeteria area where it's, that's open to the public and it has amazing art where um, there's art along the walls. It's made of glass and I think it's sandblasted and it's lit from behind. And so that's really, um, we're really lucky to have great public art in our public buildings. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Councilmember Lee. <laughs> Further comments or questions on Mr. Boylan's report, Councilmember Manfield. I, I wanna do a shout out about the, the parks and trails in Ramsey County and um, I, I I'm really grateful for it. I live in in eastern Ramsey County, and particularly the Battle Creek Park is a is a gem in that area. And I also want to do a shout out for the, the Phelan Regional Park, having lived in that neighborhood as well. Um, many times we get lost in the on the east side in the park conversation because of Como and Hidden Falls and other gems, but the East Metro area is really blessed. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Further comments or questions on the report? If not, Mr. Boylan has proposed that we authorize Ramsey County to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and a series of advisements for the county. I would turn to any of the Ramsey County Council members for a motion. So moved. Thank you, Council Member. Is there a second? We'll second. I'll okay. second that one. <laughs> Can only be one. Yeah. All right. Discussion on the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Uh, business item number seven is 2020-15, the Livable Communities Act Tax Base Revitalization Account Funding Recommendations. Uh, Marcus Martin will present on this. Welcome, Mr. Martin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to you all for putting this on your agenda today. Uh, I will start with a little bit of background about the program and then uh, go into more details about the staff recommendation. So the purpose of the account is to uh, clean up contamination uh, for projects that will improve the tax base and add uh, affordable housing or jobs. Uh, we also consider the highest public benefits for costs incurred and joint funding from uh, our funding partners. We are governed and guided by three, uh, three documents. Uh, those are the Liberal Communities Act, the uh, Long Range Regional Plan, Thrive MSP 2040, and the Liberal Communities Fund Distribution Plan. So the, think of the statute as kind of focusing on those grant-making elements uh, that relate to kind of the source of funds, the distribution limits, some of the core funding goals, uh, the long-range planning, looking at how we can meet the regional outcomes incrementally. So stewardship, prosperity, equity, livability, sustainability, uh, looking ahead through to 2040, and then finally, the distribution plan focuses on how we'd like to distribute uh, the funding annually. So each of the documents has a different timeline, slightly different focus. 
Uh, just like we did in the spring, we offered three different funding categories. So if you think of the account, and then we divided that again into three, uh, there is the seeding equitable environmental development grants. Those are for project uh, sites that do not have a project. Uh, that's not, it's not planned, it has not been identified. They're in or near an area of concentrated poverty and they're looking for funding for kind of a more limited site investigation or a partial cleanup. So most of the requests we get in this category are typically for investigation activities. We also offer site investigation grants. Those are for expected developments that are thought to have contamination on their sites, but they need additional testing to find out what type of contaminants are on the site, uh, where they are, what is the best remedy. So applicants that apply for this type of funding are generally in what people call due diligence phase of uh, real estate development. And finally, the cleanup grants. The cleanup grants are intended for redevelopment projects that have already completed their investigation, and they're looking for public funding to clean, help clean up the site. Uh, these are the projects that we know the most about, uh, both in terms of the cleanup need itself and uh, the development, the construction, or the adaptive reuse. So let's take a look at what we got here in this particular funding cycle. Uh, we received 18 applications, uh, totaling 6.4 million for projects in Edina, Falcon Heights, Minneapolis, New Brighton, Roseville, St. Paul, and West St. Paul. Uh, most of the applications, as usual, were for cleanup, so 16 of those. We received two investigation requests. We did not receive any seed requests this time. We have just under uh, 4 million uh, to offer for all of the grant com categories combined. Uh, so as I mentioned, 6.4 million was requested. The account is oversubscribed. Uh, this is an important condition for imposing funding limits that are required by statute. Let's take a look at the individual grant recommendations. So starting with the investigation, uh, staff is recommending funding for one investigation application. This is uh, located at 1222 University uh, in the amount of $49,200. Next, let's look at the cleanup. We'll get back to the ones that are not being recommended later on. All right, staff is recommending uh, 10 cleanup projects for funding, and I'll read through them. Uh, 14th and Central, 370,500. RBC Gateway, 425,000. Twin Lakes Station, 722,500. Amundsen Flats, 400,500. 907 Winter Street, Northeast, 185,000. Amber Apartments, uh, 180,700. Stonehouse Square Apartments, 140,700. Creekside at Ben White, 367,000. Now this, I'm just gonna pause for a moment here. This is one project that was affected by the uh, statutory limits that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, continuing, uh, Waterford Bay, 316900 and Stryker Avenue, $179,800. So let's look at those funding limits. So when the account is uh, oversubscribed, when there's high demand for the funds, up to 50% can be awarded to a single community, and up to 75% of the funding can go to Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, combined. So that limit can come from one higher cost project. It could come from multiple projects all uh, added together. So in terms of this uh, particular round, uh, the amount uh, recommended to the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, there is also that 70, is that 75% limit, is 65% uh, of the total available and 60% of the recommended amount. So that is below the 75% maximum, so this uh, statutory limit has been met. And then looking at that single city limit, the amount recommended for all of the projects in the city of Minneapolis is also 50% uh, 50, 50 of the total recommended amount, so this uh, statutory limit has also been met. Any questions about the funding limits? Questions, committee members? See, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Lindstrom. So the cities here are Minneapolis, St. Paul, Falcon Heights, Edina, West St. Paul, and maybe one or two others. Is that tip a typical breakout? 
for cities that apply. Mr. Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Martin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, yes, we typically get a, a, a large number of applications from the uh, central cities and from first ring suburbs, and then occasionally uh, from what we would call suburban and emerging edge under Thrive. Um, I, I personally, I'm very happy with the distribution. I thought it was very good, very uh, varied. Um, it had uh, a lot of different product types and a lot of different other factors too, with near transit in a transit corridor, um, and there is concentrated property and so forth. So I'm very pleased. With it. Thank you, Councilmember Lindstrom. And is that primarily because the outer areas of the region have less contamination? Uh, Mr. Martin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, that is correct, and, and also in the sense of the historical use. So uh, contamination uh, is like many things in that it doesn't respect necessarily property boundaries, political mm. boundaries, um, and so it depends a lot on that use before, but uh, contamination can also come from things that are very widespread, so gas stations, right? There's probably a gas station in everywhere you've ever been, somewhere. Uh, if it's very old, if it's been there for a very long time, there is some chance that like that uh, poses some environmental risk. Council Member Vento, qu uh, questions on the statute of yes. funding limits. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What, um, what responsibility do the industries have for the contamination cleanup? Mr. Martin. Well, Mr. Chair, mem members of the committee, uh, the responsibility in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll focus on just for the grant program yep. rather than overall. Yep. Uh, so in terms of the grant programs, what we look at is, is there a viable responsible party that is clearly uh, caused the contamination and have some recourse uh, for uh, paying for the contamination? What we take into account in addition to that, though, is if uh, the new use. So, for example, there are many cases where a property could be contaminated. It has been, let's say, somewhat dealt with. The property under the current rules can continue to function as is. Mm -hmm. So let's say you had a, a, a tank, a leaking tank of some sort. You've plugged that leak. That leak is already into the ground. <clears throat> Maybe you don't have responsibility to chase that leak, but you can continue to use your property with that tank on it. But when it comes to redevelopment, which is the focus of our uh, program here, um, what then that responsibility changes somewhat. As a new owner, a new person coming to that property, if you did not invest, work, move that land, dig that dirt, you didn't move it around, you don't have often responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. um, so in some cases, then, there will be a chance where the private owner may clean it to a standard where they could continue to use it in the current use, but that may not be sufficient for whatever is planned for the future. And that's where uh, the discussion of incentives uh, mm -hmm. comes into play. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Brandt, you? And, um, Lisa, I, at some point, and it doesn't have to be immediate, but I think it would be interesting to have a conversation about what the metro region communities, counties, townships, the Met Council can do to ensure that um, um, we continue these kinds of efforts to clean up, but that um, the entities responsible for the masses um, have their held, feet held to the fire. Um, with the level of tax increment financing and other programs, I just find it pretty offensive that taxpayers are doing the cleanup that they should be doing. So I'd, I'd be interested in that being a topic at some point. I know that's pretty volatile and maybe would get us into trouble, but it's, I think it just holds everybody accountable. Thank you, Council Member. I think we're ready to move on, Mr. Martin. Thank you. So looking at the unfunded applications, the applications that we are, a staff is not recommending for funding, there are seven of them, uh, one investigation and six uh, cleanup projects. Uh, starting with uh, 1345 Central Avenue, this is the investigation. Uh, the grant from one of our funding partners, Hennepin County, is likely to fund this one. So we are not recommending funding for it uh, from this account at this time. 
Uh, two of the projects uh, scored high enough to be considered for funding in our, our evaluation. That was the Amber Union in Falcon Heights and the Mosada in Minneapolis. Um, that, there, that is a correction from the staff report that if you read through that, that was listed twice as both uh, not recommended and uh, not eligible, but it actually is eligible but not recommended. So that's, I'll make that correction in the, in the final copy. Uh, so in this case, there just wasn't enough funding to provide significant support for, for these two projects. Um, in the case of Falcon Heights, or more specifically, but uh, it also ran into that uh, statutory funding limit in the case of Minneapolis. For the remaining projects, um, according to our criteria, our grant criteria, uh, cleanup projects must have an evaluation score of at least half, 75%. Uh, 75 points out of 150, I should say. Uh, the projects on your right uh, did not score high enough to meet the minimum score uh, to be recommended for funding. So the applicants are there welcome to reapply uh, for funding this spring uh, if, if we continue the same schedule as we have this year. Um, I have gotten a chance to talk with uh, at least half of these here, and there is some interest in it. So if the, uh, shown here are the cumulative benefits to the region if the staff recommendation is approved. Uh, after redevelopment, gains are expected in the tax base, jobs, housing units, including affordable units, as well as commercial and industrial space. And in closing, uh, the staff recommendation to this committee, uh, as listed in the business item, is that the Metropolitan Council award 11 tax base revitalization account grants, as shown in table one of the business item, and authorize its Community Development Division Director to execute the grant agreements on behalf of the Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Questions on that report? Councilmember Alice Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. I think one thing that would be interesting, um, not necessarily for right now today, but going forward when we see these, is it possible to, re to receive aggregated data by geography of the history of the grant program or some period of time? I'm curious about where just the geography of where these grants are being used and it'd be interesting to see an overlay of communities that have known significant issues and are the grants going to areas where those um, uh, pervasive um, issues with um, contamination and pollution are i was just um, reminding myself man two weeks off and you get rust <laughs> <laughs> um, so i was reminding myself of some um, some information we received not too long ago even, I think it maybe it even was in December around just the amount of pollution that in particular people of, it, of color, indigenous people and low income people are exposed to. And I just wonder if it makes sense for us to be kind of monitoring and seeing how we're doing at overlapping these grants with those areas. If hotspots the right word, I'm not sure, but does that make sense? Mr. Martin? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yes, that does make sense. I, I will uh, just offer to you that it is somewhat difficult to have a comprehensive inventory of pollution, sure. it, it, the exposure levels and so forth. Um, but we certainly can provide more information. Thank you. Uh, further questions on the report? Councilmember Lindstrom. Um, I, I was disappointed to see that the Amber Union project isn't moving forward. It's 120 units of affordable housing right on the A-line. Um, seems like a great project. And I'm wondering if, I guess a couple of things. One, you said they're invited to apply next spring. Did I did I hear you correctly? Mr. Martin? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Yes, the applicants are welcome to reapply. And that, that would be for funding a year from now, essentially around this time. 2021 is that right or is there another like round in the spring of of funding that goes out yeah, mr chair members me, we offer the funding uh twice annually typically if we continue that practice we would be available uh to apply sometime in may and awards would be made sometime in late june okay uh, so there would be an opportunity for for that project mm -hmm. thanks and if i may mr chair is do you know uh for the projects that did not receive funding are any of them applying through different uh, sources of livable community categories 
or is it just this one? Mr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, just for clarification, in terms of the funding, you're referring to uh, other non-council sources? Is that uh, No, council, council sources like... Uh, oh, I see. This know. the other liberal communities that counts. Exactly. Right. I see. Yeah. I see. Um, in, in, in that particular case, uh, they did not. Um, I understand that uh, project involves some bond financing. Um, it will also have state and uh, national historic credits. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason for uh, waiting on the recommendation was that those sources are not committed yet. Um, they have another a large amount of bonding that they would like to request. Um, there is potentially some uh, interest in requesting funding for uh, support from Minnesota Housing, too. So those are great unknowns at this point, but I think there is time to resolve those. And one just Come from the restroom. One just to follow up, just in general, um, I'm wondering the projects that were above 75 but didn't receive funding, um, well, at least with the Amber Union project, I'm I'm thinking, and I, I don't recall exactly, but I'm thinking that there's probably a lot of asbestos in that old building that's there right now. And is it accurate to say, in general, that the projects that did not receive funding are not, quote unquote, bad enough of a contaminated site? Like if they were more contaminated, then they would score higher? Is that accurate to say or not? Mr. Murray. To say. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, that is one of the factors that we look at, uh, certainly. Um, the uh, sites that are the most contaminated do receive the most credit, the ones that would have present the highest risk to individuals and that would be the cleanest after completion. Um, you're correct that in that case of that particular site, um, most of the contamination is related to interior building materials in the building, um, asbestos and, and some lead based paint, uh, most of which is in good condition and, and uh, somewhat uh, would be more concerned if affected by the construction redevelopment inside, interior redevelopment, I should say. Uh, so I, I think in the case of, but however, it is not the only factor. Um, so I, I, I think it is a still a viable uh, project for our funding, uh, given a different, um, a different, different competitors, and, and at a different time with more uh, certainty about the financing. So it's kind of a, a good news, bad news scenario. It's like good news, your site isn't very contaminated. <laughs> bad news, you don't get the money. <laughs> at least this round. I am in queue. Council members Atlas Ingerbitson, Chambliss, and Wolf. Council member Atlas Ingerbitson. I think, Chair, I would just, I thought I would just share a question that I asked kind of sidebar to um, uh, regarding reviewing of the rubrics. I think we've had um, a couple of things that have come up over the last several um, months where we're, you know, curious as to why something doesn't get through. And just, so I was just asking when we meet to review rubrics, we'll be looking at all the different rubrics and the answer was yes. And so I think that that's one place where it would probably be good for us to retain some of the projects that we were kind of, that didn't make it so that we could ask, how did that not fit the rubric so we can be critical and, and thoughtful in our, our thinking about them and then projects that did and, and why they were successful so that we can um, be thoughtful and that that's an op the big opportunity that we have to have um, to just make sure that the it's working the way that we're all hoping mm -hmm. that it is. Thank you for that point, Julia. This is an interesting list because there isn't a big drop off at the end. There isn't a big bubble in the list. So I'm sure it took a lot of analysis and discussion to come up with this recommendation. Uh, further uh, questions on the report, Councilmember Chambliss. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Yes, I, my question was partially answered by Councilmember Lindstrom as far as um, the Amundsen Flats. My, I, I was curious about those uh, projects where they were not eligible due to, to the cost being too high for the particular grant. Um, and then there was the discussion that there are other sources of income, so that did really help. Um, and then also that they have a chance to apply again. With, with that, are we going back to those who didn't make the cut to say, you know, these are potential 
um, ways to close the gap in terms of funding. Mr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I, I do offer uh, that they may reapply for the funding. Um, if, if I have known of an, another source, I will give that referral as well, if they have not already uh, noted that, they, that that's available for them. Okay, thank you. And then, Councilman Chavez, was the first part of your question, was that about the impact of the statutory limitations? No. On this? Okay, no. thank you. I misunderstood. Well, uh, Councilman Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was looking through the, the detailed things in the staff report and uh, the Stonehouse Square apartments. It says that they, it's an existing building and they found the mess putting in drain tile. That's not a normal thing. Usually we have... <coughs> you know, something's being totally torn down and redone or whatever, or the building is being reused for something else. Um, what happened there? And how old is that building and why did they miss the contamination before? Mr. Martin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So in that case, uh, yes, that is a preservation project is how we would look at that. Those are occupied affordable units. Um, so we want to keep help support, keep people in those units. The work that in question, the drain tile has not been put in yet. And so this is the issue that when they have uh, problems with localized flooding in that area, and so they need this drain tile, but in order to uh, put that in, that's where they discovered that they have a significant amount of contaminated soils. That is not unusual for an area that has a long history of uh, in industrial use, um, particularly kind of closer to the riverfront like that project is. Um, so part of it is, again, that aspect of if it is, it's a in, in health terms, it's a question of what is the risk to the inhabitants depending on where it is. So if you're not, if it is below a certain uh, distance, you know, it's very unlikely, for example, that you'll go out and dig five feet down in your apartment building, you know, down, down there. And so there's very little risk, uh, depending on the contaminant of that contaminant affecting you. It depends on the type, of course. Um, so that's what I'm in this case. So in this case now, they do have to dig. Uh, so they're exposing that risk where it was not a risk before. And so now it has to be dealt with. Okay. Thank you. Further questions from Mr. Martin on his report? Further questions? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Martin has brought us a recommendation that we award 11 tax-based revitalization account grants and authorize the Community Development Division Director to execute the grant agreements on our behalf. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Any discussion? Discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for your Thank work you. and for your report. And our final business item, number eight, is 2020-16. Uh, we'll be seeing this this week in the Bullmet Council meeting. It's adoption of the Livable Communities Act Affordable and Lifecycle Housing Goals for 2011 to 2020 for Little Canada. And Ms. Beard will present on this. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> As you stated, I'm Tara Beard. I'm the manager of the Livable Communities Unit in Community Development. And as you may also be aware, um, participation in the Livable Communities Act programs is voluntary and predicated on a couple of um, statutory requirements, including the adoption of affordable and life cycle housing goals. Uh, we do that on a decennial basis following other cycles you're familiar with, the comp plan process um, and uh, uh, forecasting and, and allocation of affordable need, housing need. Um, <clears throat> But a community that hasn't um, enrolled en masse with all of the communities at those decennial touch points is still eligible to apply and join the program on an annual basis. So I say all that because this year you'll be hearing a lot about the re-enrollment process for the 2021 to 2030 Livable Communities Act participation re-enrollment. This is actually um, for uh, the City of Little Canada to be able to participate in the 2011 to 2020 cycle that we are wrapping up right now for livable communities, um, which um, would allow them to be eligible to apply for funds this coming year, 2020. So we currently have 96 communities that participate in the Livable Communities Act programs. Um, the three requirements to participate are the adoption of affordable and life cycle housing goals, um, that a, a housing action plan is established to address how a community intends to meet those goals, and that a community spend uh, an affordable and life cycle housing opportunity amount, which is calculated as defined in statute um, toward creating uh, affordable and life cycle housing opportunities. 
the most recent addition to the program, I believe, was two years ago, or maybe just one, City of Shakopee. Yeah. Um, becoming a Livable Communities Act participating community also requires um, a couple other details that the local government pass a resolution by November 15th of any year. So for re-enrollment in, in the coming decade, we'll see a lot of communities uh, adopting uh, affordable life cycle housing goals for the 2021 decade uh, before November 15th of 2020. Um, Little Canada did adopt prior to November 15th, 2019, affordable and life cycle housing goals to participate. And the resolution includes the documentation that they elect to participate in the program, agree to the goals, and commit to spending their affordable and life cycle housing amount annually. Um, next, the council holds a public hearing, which was opened in December and closed um, towards the end of the month. And then the council has to adopt a resolution of the negotiated goals for all newly participating communities by January 15th of each year. That's why this is on a same week cycle. So it can get in front of the council before the 15th. So the city of Little Canada has passed a resolution electing to participate, uh, agrees to its <clears throat> affordable and life cycle housing goals, which are consistent with housing council's policies and commits toward contributing toward its affordable and life cycle housing goals. And the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council approve the attached resolution 2021, 2020-1 perhaps I should say, adopting the Livable Communities Act Local Housing Incentives Account Affordable and Life Cycle Housing Goals by the City of Little Canada to participate in the Livable Communities Act for calendar year 2020. Thank you, Ms. Beard. Uh, questions on that report? Any questions? Seeing none, I'm rapidly trying to figure out whose district this is in. Oh, all district, <laughs> all district. Is, all right, so I would turn to uh, Council Member Mento. Mr. Chair, thank you. I'd like to move approval. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Our discussion on that report? Any discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Ms. Beard, for your work and for your report. We'll now move into our information items on our agenda and the first is the parks and trails legacy 25 year plan overview and Mr. Mullen is here to present. Welcome, happy new year. Thanks Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, I'm Emmett Mullen, I'm the regional parks manager uh, in the community development division. And today I'm gonna provide an overview of the parks and trails legacy 25 year plan. Um, but first, I just wanted to give you a little background. So some of you may remember the passage of the, of the um, Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment in 2008. This was a really big deal because it was passed to increase sales tax at the time of a recession. Uh, but people, I think, really believed in it, and it passed at a very high margin. Um, there are four funds included in the Legacy Amendment. Uh, there's Clean Water, Habitat, arts and culture, and then the most important one, the parks and trails <laughs> uh, legacy, also the smallest. Um, but since its inception in 2009, uh, there have been over $200 million directed to the metropolitan regional park system. So it's a really significant funding source for our regional park system. Many people have called it a game changer for our regional park system. Um, and um, there are three primary entities that are involved in the implementation of it. Um, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, they manage the state uh, parks and trail system. Uh, the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, they manage the outstate um, regional park system and then the metropolitan regional park system. And here are our 10 regional park implementing agencies. Um, these are the people that actually own and operate the regional park system. Um, just to place uh, the Parks and Trails Legacy uh, grant program in context, this is a slide I've used in a, in a previous um, presentation to you, but it is one of five uh, regional park system funding programs um, and a very significant one at that. Um, the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund, a really important takeaway for this presentation is that the Metropolitan Council is the fiscal steward of the, of the Legacy Fund. 
and we pass 100% of these funds through to those 10 regional park implementing agencies as directed by law. Um, the, I was talking to Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen about this pie chart because it's a little complicated, but let me just tell you two really important things about it. Um, the, the fund is statutorily directed, so right off the top, 10% of the fund is directed to the Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund program. The remaining 90% is um, directed through a funding formula that includes non-local visits, uh, the particular jurisdiction's population, and then uh, the percent proportion of the operation and maintenance expenditures of the particular jurisdiction. So that's the formula that gets it out, out the door. Um, the, the fund supports um, the implementation of the Regional Parks Policy Plan and the four uh, pillars, which I'm going to get into uh, in just a minute. Um, the, I wanted to mention um, a, um, an action that the 2019 state legislature took and um, the early history of the Parks and Trails funding uh, was the funding split that the state legislature made was one of um, kind of acrimony and conflict. Uh, the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund was a part, it was a point of conflict where the DNR, Greater Minnesota, and the Metro Regional uh, implementing agencies, there was just a lot of fighting at the council. So back in 20, 2011, the legislature directed uh, the creation of a, of a consensus recommendation among the um, three principal entities, DNR, Greater Minnesota, and us. And um, we came up with a 40-40-20 uh, funding recommendation. That has carried for four biennia, so eight years. Um, now there is a return to the table, um, and that's what this slide is about. So the 2019 uh, state legislature said, go back to the table, uh, put together a nine person uh, funding work group uh, and come up with a new uh, funding recommendation which needs to be pre uh, presented uh, by no later than June 15th uh, for the governor's consideration in the, in the fiscal year 2022 and 2023 uh, budget and potentially beyond. So hold your hats. Keep you posted. <laughs> um, so that was really just a little bit of context to set up now the Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. Um, so here's a, a picture of, of the plan uh, that was created in 2011, and it still has a lot of uh, gravitas and, uh, and importance for the direction of how this fund is spent. Um, the plan has a really big vision, um, and uh, the Parks and Trails uh, vision for Minnesotans and residents of our region is really that by the time that the fund is set to expire in 2035, um, our world-class Parks and Trails connect everyone to the outdoors. They create experiences that inspire a legacy of stewardship for the natural world, and they provide fun outdoor recreation opportunities that strengthen friendships, families, health, and spirit now and into the future. So it was, I, I thought, a really um, important uh, vision that this, that this plan sets. Um, there are four uh, primary strategic directions uh, that, that really make up the heart of the plan, and they are connecting people in the outdoors. That's the first one. The second one is acquiring land and developing opportunities. Then taking care of the existing system, taking care of what we have, and then coordinating among the partners that provide those recreational opportunities. So um, as an aside, I was involved in the, in the creation of this plan. Uh, I was working for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources at the time. And um, there was a real high bar set for public uh, participation with this plan. And, um, you know, there were a lot of groups out there that were saying, oh, we need to focus this entire fund on just that land acquisition, or we need to, before we spend a penny, we really need to make sure that the existing system is in great shape. And um, I think that uh, what ultimately transpired with this plan is that the legacy fund needs to, to 
to support the whole array of park and trail opportunities. And so that's what I think this plan really provides is that framework for thinking about how to create a world-class system. Um, so now I'm gonna just walk through those four pillars and then open it up for questions. Um, but the first strategic direction of the plan is connecting people in the outdoors. And the idea for this pillar was really, it emerged in the early 2000s with um, the concern that about declining outdoor recreation participation, uh, particularly around declining participation among youth. Uh, and this was troubling news and the plan really wanted to do something about it. It identified a broad array of target markets, including youth, young adults, families and children, people of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, people of all abilities, new immigrants, and older adults, kind of everyone but older white men. <laughs> um, we're doing pretty well. Um, the, um, the plan had a real focus, though, on children, and I just wanted to call that out, viewing them as the pathway to the future. Um, this photo in the plan is of uh, the Lake Elmo Park Reserve Swim Pond, which was a legacy project. But what I wanted to focus on was that the uh, Washington County created these um, public service announcements in uh, four different languages. Uh, which was really innovative, and that was paid for with legacy funds. Additionally, they created an electric, electronic sign at the, at the gate of, of the Lake Elmo Park Reserve, which uh, presents important information in four languages also. So it was a, it was a good creative use. Um, the second pillar is around um, acquiring land and developing opportunities. Uh, this first picture is of Coney Island, which is in Carver County, uh, which I'm sure Council Member Wolf remembers. Uh, this was a 34-acre island that Carver County purchased with the help of the um, Parks and Trails Legacy Fund. Um, the second part of this is developing opportunities, so capital improvements. This is Eastman Nature Center at, at um, uh, Elm Creek Park Reserve um, in western uh, Hennepin County. But an amazing... Uh, new redevelopment because it was kind of an old tired uh, nature center and it's got great uh, environmental benefits in terms of how it uses energy and whatnot but also a really engaging design that is really attractive to uh, bring people out um, the the third pillar is around taking care of what we have and i want to just focus that there, there's both a capital development side of taking care of what we have, as well as a natural resources side. Uh, this photo shows a picture of Bidet Makaska, part of the chain of lakes. Uh, there was a huge push a couple of years ago uh, with the Minneapolis Park Board investing in curb cuts, um, improving road crossings and removing barriers to those trails because there were a lot of uh, missing accessibility components. Um, Another one I didn't create a direction of, but the Minneapolis Park Board is using legacy funds to uh, fund um, the master planning for Minnehaha Parkway. Um, all you hear in the news is, are people gonna be able to continue to drive on the parkway, which they are. Uh, that's what the Park Board has directed. This is a plan that's still in process, but what I wanted to call out is, that it is a really exciting and bold uh, environmental um, stewardship. Um, rec they're making a lot of recommendations for really restoring that creek, which isn't in great uh, shape. Um, the fourth and final pillar is around coordinating among partners. This one, I, as I said, is around how we work together. Um, this slide is a picture of this uh, joint website, the DNR, Greater Minnesota and the uh, Metropolitan Regional folks uh, and Minute, uh, the IT group, um, worked on and it's a it's sort of a one-stop shop for finding state and regional uh, parks and trails opportunities across Minnesota. But it was a great an example. The other one I wanted to call out is um, the Parks and Trails uh, Legacy Advisory Committee, which is a 17-member citizen uh, board that broadly oversees the implementation of the Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. Uh, Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen was the first 
chair of that group and really helped it get its feet on the ground. The um, final slide I have today is just um, the Legislative Coordinating Commission. Um, this is the Minnesota legislature um, oversees sort of the, the reporting on the legacy fund. And this is where you can go for project level information on all projects around the um, legacy fund. So broadly the habitat, clean water, arts and culture, but also the parks and trails one. Um, and it's a great place to go and find project level information. Um, so that is uh, my high level overview. Um, this is a really important uh, plan as well as a funding source for um, our state and our metropolitan regional park system. And uh, in partnership with uh, council member Atlas Ingerbritz and we just wanted people to know about it because this plan has really been used, it is being used and it will continue to be so. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Questions for Mr. Mullen on that report, council member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to um, say my quick comment that legacy funding funds the uh, Metropolitan Regional Arts Commission, and at my day job, our building is right next door to them, and I've sat on their grant review pa panels before, and they do incredible work, too. And I I'm not trying to be funny, but what happens in 2034? What happens to your job and, and our regional parks? Um, Mr. Mullen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Lee, um, the the fund will expire, and uh, and so that's a great question because uh, it's possible that they will renew um, the the um, sales tax that will fund these important uh, uses. But uh, unless uh, we continue to work on public awareness of the benefits of the fund, uh, it'll be a harder sell because uh, sales tax increases are never very popular. And so we really have uh, an important job to do to talk about uh, what this fund is for and how we're using it wisely. Thank you. Councilmember Atlas Ingerbitson and Councilmember Wolf. Thanks, Chair. I, I have more of a kind of some comments as opposed to a question, but um, I think that was a really great question, Councilmember Lee. The, um, we have work to do as the body that um, is the stewards for the legacy funds for the metropolitan area. That's what we approve. And I think sometimes people think of regional parks as this park, big park that's way out there nobody goes to, but they don't think of regional parks are Worth Park. It's a neighborhood park. Shingle Creek Parkway and Weber Park, regional park. Um, Phelan, regional, that those are neighborhood parks. They're parks people walk out their door, walk across the street and walk into. Um, and the ability for those parks to be spaces that um, growing demographics see themselves in and therefore feel a stronger connection to um, nature and, and a stronger connection to self um, as well is really important. So I think there's two um, big things as being the, the first chair for the advisory committee, that was what introduced me to the Met Council, was coming here to testify on behalf of our efforts and understandings. And there are two big concerns for legacy funds. One is um, not so impactful for our aspect of it, but at the state aspect, um, so the DNR, it's the surplanting, it's the use of funds um, um, a de um, escal or decrease in funding for the DNR and then the use of these funds to surplant when these funds are meant to be um, increases in innovation and um, uh, the intent was to improve what we were doing. So that's one big issue that um, people are thinking about. The second big issue um, is something that we're still really battling and that's the utilization across those four pillars. The first pillar being connecting people to the outdoors. And this is what brought me to the Met Council and to the state legislature to testify multiple times is that we're not seeing the same amount of investment. So we hear about it all the time here at our table that we need more programs um, in our own research at the council, in conversations at the Met, uh, Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission, so MPOSC that um, I'm the liaison to for us, that there is a desire for more marketing and more programming. Those are what we know. The wonderful thing is that this 25-year plan 
really reinforces that. This is things we've known for so long. Um, and I'll just read their target markets are identified based on statistical research um, and shows key areas of declining of underrepresented populations in the outdoors as well-known areas, key areas for growth in Minnesota's population over the next 25 years. So those populations that are in most of our counties, 100% of our growth coming from are those populations who are not connecting. And those markets are youth, but they also include young adults. Young adults from all communities aren't going into the outdoors as much. Families with children. Um, at the time when I was on the advisory council, I was also the manager of Richardson Nature Center. And I can't tell you how many times I had a young mom with kids who may have got a little turned around on our trails because we didn't have great signage. <laughs> Um, but didn't have, because of the typography of that area, the geography, we didn't have good cell phone reception. And the terror when she thought she was lost. And that happened a number of times, not surprisingly enough. And that just that hesitancy to get out into the outdoors is definitely there for families. Um, racial and ethnic minorities, new immigrants, and older adults. And a big part of that is the accessibility of so many of our spaces as people age needing to have more um, forgiving um, trails, perhaps, or um, other resources that aid in accessing, accessing facilities. So I think our one thing I'd like to ask all of you, I, I won't ask you for, I'll ask you for tons of things, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but um, I'd really love, this is a plan that was put together so well. It's so rare that we have something where we take the time to talk to people and people were connected with across the state, young people, diverse people, old people, all kinds of people. It was really an amazing plan to see put together and it's so high quality. If we don't accomplish what's there, I think it's really gonna be hard in 2034 to say we deserve more. Um, and right now there's a major part of the work that we are not investing in. The last report I saw aggregated that data, it was less than 9% of the resources went to non-capital investments. And that's a fourth, if you look at the four pillars, that should be a fourth of, of the investment. So um, we know we hear it here, um, that's an opportunity. I would take a look at that plan. There's a lot of wonderful research and information in it. It is 81 pages, but it is really worth it. And frankly, I think it's kind of an easy read. So. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember. Further discussion on Mr. Mullen's report, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Lee's question as well um, with that information that, that Councilmember Atlas Ingebrigtsen talked about this, this supplementing, not supplanting. That's been actually a big issue in the Metro as well because <coughs> state law says that um, the, the legislature is supposed to fund 40% of the operations and maintenance costs for the regional park agencies, the 10 agencies. And the highest it ever got was 17%, and it's been dropping ever since. We're down at like 9, 10 okay. now. <laughs> so it has definitely uh, supplanted rather than supplemented the, the operations and maintenance funding for the, the metro area. That, that's a big problem when the, the agencies themselves are paying for 90% of their operations and maintenance costs for a regional system. And people don't realize how many people use our system versus using the state park system. This, the, the regional system has at least four times as many visitors annually as the state park system does. So, I mean, that's something that needs to be part of the discussion when you decide that 40, 40, 20 or something else split, but people don't want to want to think about that. Our, our state parks are mostly well-developed, but old and, and they're not accessible to disabled people. Um, that, that's their biggest issue, but we have large parts of our park system that don't have anything. I mean, there's a couple parks in Dakota County that don't have hardly anything or nothing at all on them. There's parks in Scott County that are the, are the same way. So the needs are different within our systems. There's, there's a lot in Minneapolis that, that is being maintained because it's been there for a while, but there's other parts of our system that just don't have 
anything and, and so they're using the money to put things in so that people can actually go to the park. That was just my two cents. Thank you, Councilmember. Further discussion on the report, Councilmember Ballet S. Ingerbitson, then Councilmember Lindstrom. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that. That was not the lens that I, I brought. Um, and, um, and I think that's, that's really one. important because those are the things that people are going to nitpick around and it's, mm -hmm. you know, what's the benefit. But it's also, um, it happens in other sectors too, not just in parks, but it is something where um, we have to think about what we, what we pay for. Um, as as a standard of what we want, not just um, having this become something that then over um, takes place for what we should have and protect regardless. And I think that's even more important because of our climate issues and the need to increase conservation. And I think it's just easy for us growing up here. I think we you know all have spent a lot of our lives here to take for granted these facilities and these uh, in this natural space and it is um disappearing around the world but it's disappearing here too i as we watch the comp plans i'm looking at the existing plans versus the future and as i've looked more often than not i'm seeing less and less zoned for green space and that's really worrisome to me so i just think it's important i just want to encourage us not to take it for granted and to really um, think of this as a serious part of our work at the the council, not just kind of the parks. <laughs> so. Thank you. Further discussion on the Parks and Trail Legacy 25-Year Plan Overview Report. Councilmember Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was thinking about the, the nine-person work group, yeah. and I'm wondering, are you one of the nine? And if so, uh, how, have you started to meet yet? I know you have to mm -hmm. present a report by june or so <laughs> hopefully we'll be right around the corner right maybe not quite but getting there um mr chair council mr. member lindstrom mm -hmm. um i am not uh one of the nine i am uh what's known as a parks and trails legacy liaison along with the state park director erica rivers and um renee Matson, who's the greater minnesota executive director and uh we are um supporting a team of people who are going to come together to uh, make this recommendation. Um, our chair helped select um, the three representatives that we have. Um, we have uh, Mary Jo McGuire, who's a Ramsey County Commissioner. Um, Mary Merrill, who's a former um, Minneapolis Park Board Superintendent. And um, John Gunyu, who is the current uh, board chair for Three Rivers Park District. So we have a really uh, strong team, collaborative team, but they'll, I think they'll carry Council Member Wolf's message. <laughs> so. Thank you. Right. Further discussion, Council Member Allison or Just, It'd be nice to know what that team, what the diversity beyond our, I know our, our, the recommendations we made, but what that broader team, how they reflect the populations that we're working with and the growing populations and gender diversity mm -hmm. as well. Um, I don't know if it's possible to find that out, but that would be um, nice to know. The DNR's three representatives are Assistant Commissioner Shannon Lothammer, um, the Phil Leversedge, who's the Deputy Park Director, and Scott Kelling, who's the North uh, East Regional Manager. And um, Greater Minnesota, it is Rick Anderson from Lyon County. You know Rick. Um, Marsha Laird, from, now Baird, from uh, the City of Bemidji uh, Park Manager, and uh, Mark Ongrave, he works with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but he is um, a district commissioner in the Northwest District. So. Okay. Thank you. Well done, Mr. Mo. Yeah, that was impressive. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, the first meeting is Friday, and I'm trying to get ready for it. Good job. <laughs> Great. Further discussion on Mr. Mo's report? Further discussion? Seeing none, thanks very much for reporting on this. Thank Mabrug. you for your time. Thank you. Our next information item is a status update on 24 comprehensive plan reviews. That'll be given by Angela Torres. Ms. Torres, welcome. 
and I will say, and I've said this before in, in the setting and in the full cone, so this was this is a lot of work. I mean, I can't imagine the work that you guys are doing, and it's a big part of our agendas here, but it's been really helpful early in our term to review all of these comprehensive plans, and I know I have learned so much about the broader region through reviewing, reviewing all of these. So, so what's our status, Ms. Torres? Thank you, council member um, and committee members. Um, my name is Angela Torres. I'm the manager of local planning assistance. You've seen me many times, I'm sure. Um, but all of the comprehensive plans do go through local planning assistance, and you've heard it tonight. So as Councilmember Lilligren was saying, it is a great deal of work. Um, my short presentation doesn't really do it justice, but I'm hoping to provide you some context around the work that we are doing. So this, again, is just a bit of a recap, big picture overview. You might remember that we started with um, preliminary plan reviews. We did 94 of those for communities that um, chose to do that, was not mandatory. Uh, we have 69 grant contracts that benefit 104 of the region's communities. These funds will assist in completion of 84 plans of the 168 plans that we will be uh, reviewing. We have 60 communities that requested extensions to the December 31st, 2018 deadline uh, that the council authorized. Um, the maximum amount of extension that a community could request was one year. So all of those extensions uh, have passed. So you may see a few um, that have gone past that, but we are working diligently with them um, to provide assistance and get their plans into us for review. This map identifies all of the communities that have submitted plans for review. This map, shown in green, uh, identifies all of the work that you have done to authorize plans uh, for on behalf of the council. So there are 76 authorized plans. That doesn't include the 10 townships in Scott County. That's because the county does the planning for those townships. Uh, so we don't count those as individuals because it was one plan, but um, still 76 authorized plans almost gets us at 50%. We're not quite there, um, we're close. Give us another couple meetings. So the total plans, as I mentioned, 168 plans that we have received to date are 151, and of that 151, uh, 20 plans are in process. And that means the 15 business day uh, review period that all plans uh, adhere to are represented in those 20 uh, plans. Um, 42 are incomplete currently. Uh, that means that a response has been sent to the community, that additional information is required in order to reach completeness, but that the council has received and reviewed an initial plan. 13 plans are complete and are scheduled for committee meetings, and we'll, you'll see those on upcoming agendas. Um, and uh, 76 are authorized, which I want to point, point at again because that is an accomplishment, it's a tremendous amount of work. And we have also received, of those 76, we've received 33 of the final plans that have been adopted then by the local government. So once the council authorizes a plan, um, the local jurisdiction then has to adopt by resolution that plan and submit that final adopted plan to us with that resolution for our files, and then they can start amending their plan, <laughs> which you've seen some of those amendments as well. Um, then there are 17 outstanding plans. I mentioned that as we were talking about the extensions. Seven of those are from grant communities. The sector representatives for those communities are really uh, working diligently to try and get communities to a point where they feel comfortable in submitting that plan to us. So we are in commu constant communication with those. The number used to be higher and we're taking them off one by one. So that's the big picture numbers, the quantification of it. Um, but we have started to uh, look at what comes out of the comp plans. Um, there's a lot of information across the region, a lot of different types of communities, a lot of different cha planning challenges, and we're starting to identify some of the things that we've seen across many plans. And I just wanted to touch base on a few of those things, give updates. Some of them may, you have heard about before. Um, they won't be new housing, economic competitiveness, and some others. 
uh, but I wanted to let you know where we're at right now in reviewing some of those. So of 135 comprehensive plans reviewed, that includes both preliminary and original submissions, 50% of those communities have either an economic competitiveness or an economic development chapter in those plans. And when we look at the economic uh, competitiveness, economic element of that plan, um, what we're seeing is statistics, kind of like an existing conditions analysis, um, inventory of those conditions and trends for that that community, uh, some sort of assessment of those current conditions. Uh, many chapters outline economic goals, economic competitiveness goals and related policies in addition to or instead of a more formal inventory of current conditions. Uh, here this graphic shows kind of where those are distributed uh, throughout the region and you'll see that 37 have economic competitiveness chapters and 31 have economic development chapters. As we're talking about climate change and resilience and sustainability, um, we've looked at 141 of those plans uh, so far. 132 of those plans are considered complete for the solar, the required solar element of comprehensive plans. Uh, you can see here that 37 have identified a climate action plan, which is um, a really concerted effort to identify uh, implementation actions re regarding uh, climate change. There, you can see too on, on this graphic that there are many ways, many, um, term much terminology, lots of different ways of framing the conversation and communities are trying a lot of different ways of tackling this issue and bringing information in their comprehensive plans uh, around um, resilience, sustainability, and climate. Um, right now, uh, we have seen that just over a third, 37%, go beyond that solar resilience element requirement and are, and are including uh, these other um, identified uh, elements, whether that's energy planning or some of these other things. Uh, on this graphic, a yep. as well, you're- Mr. Just have a question from Councilmember sure. Lindstrom. Yes. Just a quick clarification on this slide. Uh, so when they say, climate action plan or when you say climate action plan or energy plan, these are plans that the cities intend to do. Is that correct? Not that they already have or not that are incorporated into the current comp plan. It's what they intend to do. Is that correct? Stories. Chair Lilligren and committee members, uh, it's a mix of both. Some of them have already worked through some climate action um, planning efforts. Others have the intention of doing so, have maybe a structure and foundation around that conversation and intend to do more over time, but it's a mix of both. Yeah. And you'll see too that some of these are overlapping. They may have energy planning in their comprehensive plan as well as a climate action plan. They may have a resilience chapter as well as <clears throat> or that encompasses many of these other things. Thank you. Does that help? Okay. Yes, um, thanks. And some of these other, if I could just quick follow up, some of these other things like Green Step, I suspect they already are a Green Step city. It's not that they intend to be. And same as Soul Smart, they probably already received designation as a Soul Smart community, not that they intend to be. Ms. Torres. Council members and, and, and committee members, yes and. <coughs> So we do have some goals and policies where they will, the community will identify. We're going to coordinate with our solar advisor and Cameron Bailey is our solar advisor for the council and he works diligently with the communities to try and get more. We're never satisfied with just uh, the number of communities that are part of these programs, but it's yes and. So you'll, you'll see many communities that are already part of both of those programs and they'll identify that in their plan, but others that are, are tiptoeing into the conversation and one way to do that is accessing the free technical assistance and the resources that the council can offer in order to get them to a point where they're eligible for those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Question from Councilmember Allisinger Bretson. Thank you, Chair. I think one of the things that would be helpful is treating things kind of um, to get to a place where we can really have good information is to kind of separate those things out. So we know communities that are there communities that aren't there and communities may, that are making those efforts to get there. Um, Cause you can be making the efforts to get there for a long time and never get there or have the intention or say, this is a goal of ours. 
it just I think would be help us have a more accurate picture if we saw those separated out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Torres. I wanted to add one additional clarification on the natural, uh, the resource conservation um, bar that's on this graphic. Uh, this is primarily related to the natural resources, goals, policies, and strategies, um, most of which are found in the land use chapters of the comp plans. It's not directly related to the resilience or climate change element of a plan, but it's more so a proxy for how communities are still um, caring about the natural environment and identifying goals, policies, and strategies. And it's part of this overall broader conversation. It does feed into the climate change and resilience components, although it might not be directly related to that. And we use the, this information, this, this tracking that we're doing to talk about how we're going to provide additional technical assistance to communities and how we may offer more assistance to, to enrollment in some of these other programs and that kind of thing. So we use this to, to do our work planning as well. This is the first time I'm reporting out a little bit about the equity components that we have been tracking in our comprehensive plans. Um, council staff reviewed the authorized plan, um, 75 uh, as of December 11th, so already a little lagging behind, but um, over half of the plans men mentioned equity terms throughout the body of the plan. 29 plans explicitly mention equity in their goals or policies and 13 plans state equity as a guiding principle and or have a chapter dedicated specifically to uh, addressing equity. Uh, there is some overlap in the communities that mention equity in the goals and policies and, and um, those that use that as a guiding principle because obviously they're both related. So uh, the numbers reflect that. Uh, there is a variation in the way the communities frame equity in some of their conversations and this is how we're seeing um, interesting approaches that we can share with other communities. Um, every community has a different political background for every community, right? And some may be more or less um, able to push certain uh, identity items forward. Uh, so what we're seeing is that sometimes communities are framing it as social equity, sometimes it's very explicit as racial equity, sometimes it's health equity, all of which have direct impacts on the people in the communities and all of which can be an effective way of, of forwarding the equity conversation in that community. Ms. Torres, question from Councilmember Chambliss. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to see that we're able to look at this equity portion of the, you know, the 2040 comprehensive plans. It's a start, mm -hmm. and so that, that establishes the baseline for how we can measure progress, interest, and in how things are changing over time. Um, I know that in some of the cities that are in my district, they didn't exist until, you know, the last two, three years, and um, sharing that information with other cities mm -hmm. to see how they can benefit and get on board. Uh, I, I think that's that's great. So I'm glad to see that you're doing, we're doing that as a council. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Torres. So I wanted to give two examples of how communities have approached equity in their plans. Um, the city of Maplewood uh, takes uh, an approach where um, they state equity as a guiding principle for its plan. Uh, they use this as a framework for the policies and action items laid out in individual chapters. Um, and the plan identifies the city's in its discussion, uh, the city's hopes that this approach will help identify and address obstacles and disparities that lead to inequities within the community. So then throughout the plan, the city uses a designated icon uh, and then identifies within each of the chapters um, where that icon is being implemented, where that takes an action in order to move that issue forward. Um, and for Maplewood's plan, the icon appears in most chapters throughout um, the plan elements. And as I said, we have many different ways of framing equity, and for the city of Osseo's plan, um, they are talking about it through a health equity lens. So they have five health themes, and one of those themes is social health and equity. 
safety. And um, the city uses this element to identify and address barriers to equity in order to promote the health and well-being of all of its residents, regardless of age, race, <coughs> income, et cetera. And Osseo also uses that icon to help address, address um, throughout the plan where the, the um, goals and policies are um, tackling that health and equity component. Uh, for some county examples, both Washington County and Anoka County uh, have equity integrated throughout their entire plan. So some have it as a standalone or as a tagged item, others uh, integrate it throughout all of the plan. So I wanna talk about housing. Um, this is the first time I've reported out a little bit about housing as well. Um, many communities have noted that they want to investigate their own local 4D program and two communities in particular, Oakdale and the city of Belle Plaine, have already reached out to our technical staff and have been requesting information on how to do that. Um, I will very poorly explain uh, what a 4D program is, and if there's any follow-up questions, I may ask Tara Beard, who is in the audience, to help me out. Uh, 4D is a way for any um, community, small or large, um, where they can forfeit a, a little bit of the tax capacity to allow uh, naturally occurring affordable housing rentals uh, to maintain their current low rents and get access to some rehabilitation um, funds. So that can either be some nominal funding from uh, the community, the leverages programs or, or other organizations or big program locally. So, um, Exploration of those 4D programs is something that we're starting to see many, many communities identify as part of their housing implementation um, efforts. I'll pause in case anybody has any questions on the 4D program. I think you're good, Mr. Okay, Perfect. Continue. I did it, Tara. Good okay. job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another um, uh, portion where we're finding um, communities really talking about a new um, policy or an implementation measure is accessory, accessory dwelling units. Um, we learned that many communities, large to small, urban to rural, kind of across the region, already have some sort of ADU policy on the books, which is not something that we would necessarily know about. It tends to be a much more localized zoning effort, and that's not something that the council is always uh, in the loop about, but the comprehensive plans allow us an opportunity to learn this from our communities, and then we can provide assistance to communities as they start developing those programs, connecting them with others that are doing some of the similar things. Um, another housing um, takeaway that we've identified is around aging in place and accessible housing. Uh, many communities wrote in their plans about a need for aging in place or senior housing in creative ways. So accessible housing um, to people with both physical and mental disabilities in both areas of new construction and rehab is going to have a huge piece of this as many seniors already are struggling with some sort of ability. Um, challenge. Some counties have existing programs, so there's space for cities to step into this area, especially as it relates to social connections with aging communities. And environmentally sensitive and green housing, many communi communities, again, large to small, urban to rural, have mentioned a need for housing that does not negatively impact the environment or strong preference to use their local housing tools like TIF and bonding authority for green housing efforts. There's a lot of good work in planning assistance that we can um, provide to communities that could build upon this local political will. So this is, again, just a few of the initial takeaways. We are um, tracking other things as well that I'm not sure I have a great grasp of how to report out on yet. Um, for example, um, when the Land Use Advisory Committee and the, you might have to help me with the uh, appropriate acronym here, Metropolitan Area Moss Act, Water Supply Advisory Water Supply, Committee. Yeah, <laughs> Advisory Committee met just recently. Um, the ES staff there shared how their staff, their interns are tracking um, groundwater in showing up, groundwater discussions, showing up in local surface water management plans, mm -hmm. and how wellhead protection is showing up in local water supply plans. 
um, both of which speak to an integrating integrated water planning approach that's encouraged in the council's master water supply plan and so then as of uh, the beginning of December um, the ES staff have reviewed 139 of the 168 plans with some of these things as the initial steps into they have much more technical takeaways too that's really high level but there are other uh, technical work units that are also investigating and we will be reporting out on those uh, in the future as well um, there is what we would call a comp plan composite that we will deliver to that's uh, something that would also include land use, the new regional land use landscape, and we would provide some analysis, additional analysis on how communities have changed from the 2030 planning process to the 2040 planning process and where some of those land use takeaways are happening as well. And I believe that that will happen sometime in the summer of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> we need time. It depends actually on how uh, quickly, um, the majority of authorized plans kind of happen. So we can't, uh, we have to have more authorized plans than not. And we're not, like I mentioned, we're not quite at 50% yet. So that will come in time, but we are planning to come back and report out on those as well. Uh, there are other uh, trends as well as it re relates to uh, financial planning. Some communities do that. Uh, connected and automated vehicles is a new thing that we're seeing in some of the transportation plans. And then there are more communities that are doing some of the health planning as well. So those are all things that we're going to continue tracking, exploring more in depth, and we'll be coming back and reporting out um, on what we learn from there. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Torres. Questions on that report? Any questions? Oh, thanks. We look forward to the next status update as well. This is really interesting data, the way you're presenting it. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We'll move on to our <clears throat> final agenda item and information item number three. It's the 2020 Community Development Committee Work Plan, and that will be presented by Director Barajas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. I, uh, in the interest of time, will... Oh, I'm sorry, can I just interrupt you? I'm sorry, Lisa, to interrupt you, but I was just going to say that Director Barajas will make sure that the Ms. Torres uh, PowerPoint presentation is linked from the agenda as well, so we'll have that available. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, okay. thank you. Uh, absolutely, we'll be sure that gets done. Um, so you can peruse that further. And <clears throat> so related to what Angela was saying, we have a number of items um, that we are planning to bring to you this year part of them, um, and you see them in the draft uh, staff report in front of you, uh, information item. Um, we have our regular business, I'll say how we build this, is the stuff that we always have to do, the things we do on an annual cycle, so our livable communities programs, the things that uh, related to our um, public housing agency and the, and the different plans we have to adopt and uh, payment standards we have to adopt at different times of year. Um, review of comp plans and amendments, kind of the ongoing work that you'll regularly see. Uh, similarly, in regional parks, um, uh, uh, grant reviews and master plan reviews. So we have a lot of baseline work that fills your agendas on a regular basis. And then we have our 2020 initiatives. And these are things that are, that maybe only happen once every 10 years, like the comprehensive plan composite, some of the report outs on what more detailed report outs on, on what we're finding in those plans, um, in depth uh, uh, analyses. Um, and if you p turn to page uh, three of the report, you'll see some of these other items as well. Um, as Tara had mentioned earlier our re-enrollment process in the 20 for the 2021 to 2030 uh, decade for livable communities, our regional parks visitor study, which we do about every five years ish, or we're trying to do every five years ish. Um, Metro climate stats are uh, continuing to track on our moving to work authorities for the public housing agency, and then. Um, uh, additional work there. You can see as well that we have regular information items and reports um, telling you about the, the state of development in the region, so affordable housing production, plant monitoring, egg preserves, which we recently heard from um, Raya Ismaili about, um, our fiscal disparities report, regular reports from LUAC, etc. Um, 
I don't mean to rush through everything, but I do um, wanted uh, to bring this in front of you with kind of these questions in mind about um, making sure that we're capturing the things um, coming from your conversations um, about your uh, this last fall around council goals and priorities. Um, a lot of items we think are things that shape our livable communities programs and some of our reporting, specifically as it relates to housing, um, the climate work, I think um, we're still investigating. We put a placeholder now around kind of um, CD related climate work, but I think a lot of that might show up more at kind of committee of the whole and council um, places. But I wanted to ask you these questions are, are we capturing the items that um, in this work plan for CDC, given those recently formed priorities, uh, then moving on, are there additional information or other reports that the committee would seek to better inform um, the work that you do and the decisions that you're charged with? And um, kind of lastly, are there any other invited speaker or panel presentations that the committee is also interested in to, again, help better inform your work? So I know that not everybody's here today. Um, the plan um, is to take your input and your input over the next um, however many weeks, um, probably two weeks so that I can prepare a final to bring to you in the first meeting of February. Um, and what you'll see in that final work plan is both this detailed list as well as sort of a, a calendar, a schedule that shows how those um, different items will show up on your um, calendar over the next 12 months in a more graphic format, kind of easy um, snapshot. So. What we have in here today, as Angela was saying, um, are related to some high level um, months when you would expect to see some of those actions. Some of those dates may change um, given how quickly we get some of those plans in, um, given some more uh, work planning discussions that we'll have as staff about when we can reasonably move things and making sure that we're not putting 15 items on one agenda and one on the next one. So really trying to balance those out as well. So um, any additional input you'd like to share tonight would be fabulous. If you'd like to email information as well, I'd be happy to take that over the next two weeks as we're forming up and finalizing plans. Thank you, Director Thank Barajas. You. Yeah. Uh, discussion, Councilmember Chambliss. Um, Thank you, Chair and um, Ms. Barajas. One of the things that I would like to see is um, as we're getting information, um, maybe looking at how we can have the information presented to us for improved decision-making. One of the things that helps me a great deal is to be able to measure where we came from and where we're going. So if, if, if um, we're looking at a comprehensive plan and it says, there's a statement that says increase to 22%, it's just easier for me to make a quick decision if I can see that it increased from 15 to 22%, for example. Um, there may be additional charts so I can see, see tr mm -hmm. identify trends. Mm -hmm. uh, what it was, and some things are so innovative and new that we don't have a trend, we're just establishing baselines. Mm -hmm. But where we have some history, maybe looking at some additional charting so we can see and measure the progress or our strengths and weaknesses a little bit better. So my recommendations are going to be in line with how we can continuously improve as an organization and how we can make better decision making uh, as a council member and also as a council and as a whole. Thank you, council member. Mm -hmm. Further discussion, council member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've kind of been a broken record on this one for, for years, but um, we're always rushed when it comes to the livable communities annual fund distribution plan. Last year, we couldn't take a deep dive because you guys were all learning what you're doing or you weren't even here in the spring. And so this year we'll, we'll be doing the, the plan for, for what goes out this year, but I would like to have some time later in the year to take a really deep, deep dive into livable communities and look at, is it really doing what we want it to do? Are our processes what they need to be to, to make to get the results that we want and that sort of thing. 
I think that's an excellent suggestion, Council Member Wolf and Director Barras and I have been talking about ways of maybe engaging smaller groups of this committee, subcommittees and things like that, definitely in the uh, Louisville Communities Re-Enrollment, for example, but I think that's another topic where it may be worthwhile for some subset of this group to get a little deeper and give some staff some direction. I think that's an excellent suggestion. And then I would also ask you, uh, like Council Member Chambers and others, as you communicate with Director Rahas with your idea, I guess I would really appreciate it if you'd include me on the communication as well, sure. just so I'm getting an idea of where the committee's going, please. Uh, further discussion, Council Member Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> One of the goals I have is uh, for this year, thinking about lowering the energy costs for, for families in affordable housing. And I'm particularly jazzed about this because I just recently read a report about the Denver Public Housing Authority. And I think just in the last month or so, they rolled out a, a two megawatt community solar garden that they own and operate themselves um, that is lowering the utility bills for something between 500 to 700 families, low income families in the Denver area by 20%. And they've made this, this subscribing to this community solar garden available to, to their families, but also to other public housing authorities in that area. And it just made me think about the 150 single family homes that we own and town homes that we own and operate and the cost burden for those families. And what can we do either in Denver, they, they own, like I said, they own and operate their own system. And they, it's a $3.8 million community solar array that, that they built. Is that a direction that we could head um, by putting a, another CSG on our uh, wastewater buffer lands, for example, or could we subscribe um, to one of the many CSGs that are already out there on behalf of the families that live in these units that we own? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the right answer is, but I, I, I would like to explore it further in this year. And I'll send you more information about I referenced this report. I'll, yeah, I'll, cool. I'll send you all uh, what I know about it. Did you want to say something? Sure, there? Mr. Chair, I would just offer that um, with the houses that we do own, because of the distributed nature of them, um, and we're not operating them like public housing, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a lot harder to do a single CSG to serve all of them. They're all kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, one of the projects though that we are investigating and, um, and I haven't added everything yet to this uh, work plan that you see in front of you because we have projects that are in the hopper that need to um, kind of get up to this point. But one of the projects we are investigating is how we might support landlords um, through our voucher program in connecting to either enrolling in a CSG or um, installing solar panels on their homes or on their buildings. So these would be um, five or six units at least um, in a building or bringing the technical assistance um, to play and help kind of reduce the um, installation costs, not through money, but through actually through selecting and and organizing the activity um, for uh, a landlord to be able to have um, solar generated power on their um, building and reduce the cost of um, energy, electricity at least for um, residents there in exchange for um, participating um, in the voucher program. So it's part of that. So we're investigating the ins and outs of that, what a program might look like, getting general interest from landlords on that and, and seeing if it's feasible. Uh, but yes, that's something that we would um, definitely come to talk to you all about, um, especially if it is feasible. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. For the discussion, Council Member Bento, do you? I have some oh. speaker or speaker topic oh, suggestions, but I'll send them an email to both. Thank you. Both you and Ms. Barajas. 
Any further discussion on the 2020 Community Development Committee work plan? I have a feeling we'll have more discussion. We may even want to draft an email to go out to the entire committee members that highlighted those, whatever there were three or four questions that you raised. I will do that, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Ooh, further discussion? Further discussion. Thank you very much. And this is a really good report, and I'm looking forward to the final. Do we vote on that? The, I'm sorry, I should have. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, at your February, your first meeting in February, you will have a business item in front of you to formally adopt your work plan. Okay. So that will be an item that will be here for the committee. It doesn't go to the council, but okay. just this committee. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Chair. Councilor um, Rental. I've been on various committees, boards, whatever, but this was one of the best beginning of the year meetings of any entity I've been, ever been involved with. I feel yeah. like... I, I don't know. It just it feel, feels really good in terms of um, continuing the portions of the conversation that obviously have to be continued, but having a really good grasp on what lies ahead in the next 12 months. So I just want to thank you and all the staff and our yeah. chair. I just, this was very, very inspiring and invigorating for me. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for that uh, for me comment. Anything else? Then seeing no business before this committee, we're adjourned.